This is the 25th of August, 1994. This is Dr. John Whitman Ray speaking to you from the hideaway, Jenny Edgley's hideaway near Narang, near Brisbane in Australia. I would like to complete the 12 points on essential fatty acids. On This is the beginning of tape two, side one of tape two, where we're going to continue on with the 12 points on essential fatty acids. I'd like to begin with number 11 <clears throat> of the 12 points. In the November 1986 journal of the National Cancer Institute Research, Research has indicated that omega-3 and one of its derivatives, as well as three of the derivatives of omega-6, were seen to selectively destroy human cancer cells in tissue culture without damaging normal cells. Number 12, Dr. Johanna Budwig, a German MD and biochemist, discovered that the blood of cancer patients was deficient in EFAs. That's essential fatty acids. A yellow-green pigment was found in place of the normal red blood pigment or hemoglobin. Along with certain dietary improvements, she gave her patients three tablespoons of fresh flax oil as a means of getting EFAs into the body. Now, flax oil is 55 to 65 percent omega-3 and 15 to 25 percent omega-6. On this program, which included no other supplements, she found that within three months, the yellow-green was replaced by red and the cancer disappeared. Now, it has been my experience in using flax oil. I might try to describe to you what flax oil actually is. If you take organically grown linseed, and you soak the linseed for about 24 hours, the linseed begins to germinate and you get a kind of a, a slimy material on the linseed uh, or the, uh, the linseed um, seeds. Now, what happens is if we take that linseed that has been partially germinated, all of the enzyme inhibitors have been destroyed which you would normally find in all types of nuts and seeds. Uh, the non-germinated nuts and seeds have a lot of enzyme inhibitors, making it very difficult to digest. For example, things like soybeans are very difficult to digest because they have a lot of enzyme inhibitors in them. But when you sprout them, the enzyme inhibitors are converted to a good enzyme, and then the, um, then the food becomes very practical to eat. A lot of your soy powders are very difficult to digest because they are made out of non-germinated soybeans. And this makes it very difficult to digest the, um, uh, to digest the soybean uh, protein. And therefore, the undigested soybean protein goes into the body and forms partially the mucoprotein. This is why in many of your children who run these um, different types of uh, milk substitutes, they, had, they develop a very heavy um, zone 6 lymphatic rosary, uh, which indicates the mucoprotein is building up in the body due to undigested uh, protein and undigested carbohydrate. Anyway, the germinated linseed has approximately 67%, roughly, of what we call flax oil. And so it takes about three tablespoons of linseed to give you two tablespoons of flax oil. And um, here you can use that as a salad dressing. You can put it into a, a smoothie. Uh, there's many things you can do with your germinated linseed to get your flax oil. Now normally what I do with my people, uh, when they come to me, they uh, ha let's say they have some cardiovascular uh, disorder where they have a high uh, cholesterol content, they have a lot of uh, fatty substances in their varicose veins, uh, they have tingling in the hands, numbness in the arms, their legs 
get painful, their knees get painful, they have cramps in their calf muscles and so on. And they have a little pain in their heart occasionally, can't, can't breathe well, and they certainly can't go out and exercise much because they, they, it ends up with too much pain in their body. With these people, I put them on about two tablespoons of flax oil three times a day. It has to be the cold pressed. It cannot be heated. It, uh, if you heat it, you destroy a lot of the essential natural ingredients. If you heat the flax oil too high, you convert it into, um, from a cis isomer, shall we say, to a trans isomer of a fatty substance. And therefore, the oil, instead of being absorbed by the body, becomes a detriment to the body. This is why we should stay away from fried foods or oils that are heated to such a high degree, or even margarine, which also has been processed under heat. So the linseed then, uh, which becomes a flax oil, about two tablespoons three times a day, and this emulsifies the cholesterol and the fatty substances in the arteries and the veins. And gradually, it takes a while to get this done. Now, what I normally do is give people a, a lipase enzyme, about two of those, three times a day, take it along with the flax oil uh, to make sure that not only the flax oil is utilized, but the emulsified fatty substances are emulsified also. And within a short time, the blocked arteries, the blocked veins, the um, uh, sometimes you have a um, people who are channeled for um, a heart surgery, you know, and we can save them from that heart surgery and get the arteries open to where they're living a normal life again. Uh, this is what we like to see. Now, flax oil also dissolves tumors. And so when you take about two tablespoons three times a day, sometimes a little bit more, this will gradually help to shrink the tumor, as Dr. Johanna Budweg has found, She's been nominated for the Nobel Prize six different times, but because of her unconventional medical practices, uh, she hasn't been, um, let's say, she, she hasn't found favor with the powers that be. And uh, when you practice unconventional medicine or alternative medicine, the powers that be do not want you to survive because you're not doing it right. You're not putting dollars in the hands of the pharmaceutical industry. A little while ago, on tape number one, I had mentioned cedarberries and their usefulness in uh, pulverizing the cedarberry that has been dried and making it into a powder. And I mentioned how effective that was in helping to restore the normal activity to the, the pancreas. I'd like to tell you a little story. I was traveling from the state of Montana in the United States down to Arizona, and I was passing through southern Utah, and a lot of the wide open desert spaces there gave me a lot of chance to just kind of pray as I drove along the road. Uh, while I was praying intently on the different methods of treating diabetes, I was asking for help on finding out how to overcome the contradictions in treating diabetes because one person says one thing, another person says another, and uh, these things confused me a bit. And uh, so on this diabetes problem, on curing the pancreas and bringing it back to normal health, I wanted to know exactly what to do for the pancreas. And driving through the southern part of Utah, as was driving down through a hilly region, all of a sudden, a voice spoke to me and says, look over the hills. Okay, I got excited about this. I stopped the car, got out, and I looked over the hills. And all I saw were these little scrubby trees all over the hills. And then I said, so, <laughs> I'm looking over the hills. Uh, uh, what am I supposed to be looking for? What am I supposed to be seeing? And then I was told very pointedly that the trees that were on the hills were what we call cedar trees. And that the time would come when these trees would be one of the most sought after herbs in the world for the healing of the sick. And I, that was very good, but I said to myself, what sickness, uh, uh, what sickness is this uh, going to help? Uh, what about these cedar trees? And then I realized at a later time that the cedar berries 
were exactly what was necessary for the pancreas, and I have been using these where the cedarberries are available. I've been using them ever since. Now, sometimes the at that time, the Germans were contracting for all the cedar berries they could get their hands on because they're making a tonic out of it in Germany and people were, uh, were getting well from the tonic. But the cedar berries are a wonderful, wonderful means of treating diabetes. And I just want to put that into our, our little um, tape here that you can all benefit from that. One of the things that we're all concerned with are what we call parasites in the body. I would like to point out that if the body is highly oxygenated, parasites cannot live in a body which is highly oxygenated. They can only live in an anaerobic condition. And where you have an anaerobic condition is where the viruses and the parasites, the microbes, germs, what have you, are all capable of proliferating because the environment is conducive for that. But on a regular program such as we have here with the enzymes and the minerals and the acidophilus and so on, the, the taking of various herbs also sometimes come into play like garlic, um, a couple of these little um, capsules of garlic three times a day or a couple of little um, uh, where you have the big bulb of garlic you take a cu couple of small smaller bulbs off the garlic and those um, just chew it eat it uh, mix it in a green drink and this garlic helps tremendously to clear these parasites out of the colon black walnut capsules will do the same thing we recommend about two of those three times a day chaparral does the same thing about two three times a day I'd like to add that the chaparral is one of the greatest healing herbs in the world that we have. And I have used this extensively for years with no contraindications of any kind, only that I've seen people get well from its use. Uh, chaparral is grown extensively in different parts of the world. Um, there's one place in all over the southern part of the United States, the southwestern part of the United States, the chaparral grows profusely. So these, uh, there's different things that you can use for parasites. The Amazon jungle, the, um, the natives use just the papaya seeds. And they take a little pouch of papaya seeds with them wherever they go. And that purges the body of the, of the parasites. I might mention that the papaya seeds also contain a natural abortive that um, is uh, so if a woman is carrying a child, she should stay away from the papaya seeds uh, where it does contain this natural abortive which consumes the placenta tissue and causes the fetus to abort. So the seeds you have to be very careful of in the papaya. If we have a liver complaint or so, we oftentimes use dandelion root or yellow dock, a couple of capsules three times a day. There are many different herbal combinations for the kidney. Juniper berries is one of the best. Uh, corn silk is sometimes used. Uva ursi is used. And a couple of capsules three times a day helps, those, um, helps the water to be removed from the body. Oftentimes, just body electronics will help the kidneys to get the uh, function returning and get the liquid out of the body. Uh, for the lungs, if you take a uh, mullen and lobelia, uh, the mullen... And it cuts the phlegm, the mucus in the lungs. The lobelia gathers it and expels it. And lobelia is another herb which is one of the most marvelous herbs in the world. Uh, it is used in the Thomsonian method of herbology where the lobelia is used in every single um, herbal formulation. It's marvelous. For cardiovascular problems, the... Um, we often use the hawthorn berry extract. Uh, this helps to clean out the incrustations around the valves of the heart um, throughout the arteries, arteries and venous system, and it helps to stimulate the heart to normal function. I mentioned earlier about the, um, about the um, essential fatty acids found in the flax soil. I might add that if we put lecithin with the flax soil, 
it causes the material in the arteries and the veins to liquefy somewhat, making it easier for that to emulsify. So sometimes a good lecithin, uh, preferably in a capsule form where it hasn't lost its power, uh, will do the job on helping to um, not only feed the brain as this is brain food, but it also helps to clear out some of the cholesterol and fatty substances that are in the, the arteries and the veins. Now one thing that I do want to talk to you about, again, is the amino acids. There's different f things that we can consume that has a lot of amino acids in it. One of the best is bee pollen, but make sure that it is unheated. Many times they take the bee pollen and put it through a rotary heater and heat it at a high enough temperature to destroy the enzymes, which helps the bee pollen to last a long time on health food shelves. Uh, they do the same thing with spirulina. And so if you're going to take a spirulina or a corella or a bee pollen as a source of your amino acids, then be sure to make sure that it is an unheated form that your body can benefit from it. For meat eaters, as you're giving up gradually your um, heavy meat eating, which the body is not adapted to digest, and move slowly into uh, fish, uh, so on, the fish, if it's eaten raw, is absolutely quite delicious, and it has all of your amino acids uh, in that f uh, raw fish. And I'd recommend this as a good source of protein. And so as people are slowly coming down off of their meat eating, and switching into eggs and, um, and fish and so on, the fish is an excellent source of your, of your amino acids. Now, one of the balances that we need in our body is a magnesium-calcium balance uh, to the ratio of two to one, where two parts of magnesium to one part of calcium. Uh, there has been too much emphasis on calcium and this is causing the body to calcify, the skin to age, the, the wrinkles to form on the skin, uh, people to, uh, to prematurely, um, shall we say, get stiffness in their joints and bones and whatnot. And to correct that condition is to take a lot of chlorophyll into the system. The chlorophyll not only helps to correct anemia problems, but it also helps to stimulate the calcium pump so that the mitochondria at the cellular level, which becomes calcified, is able to start functioning normally again by letting the, calci the calcification come out of the um, um, mitochondria so it will function properly to give energy to the body. If the mitochondria is all calcified, then you don't get the ATP the, uh, uh, being generated there to give the energy to the body, and the body begins to start running down. Another thing that will be very useful is potassium. And oftentimes, people who have illnesses are potassium deficient. And should uh, a good source of potassium is the um, material which we have is left over from the uh, from the wine industry. It's all the seeds and all the other residue at the bottom of the pot. And if uh, you take this and grind that up, you get a good cream of tartar out of it. And that's usually full of lots of potassium. You take about a tablespoon a uh, um, couple times a day to get the potassium in your system. Now, the purified water, which I'm not going to get into here in, in abundance, purified water is extremely important. And here's where we should drink no water that contains chlorine. Chlorine interacts with all of the organic acids in your water to form what they call trihalomethanes. And you get all kinds of carcinogenic materials coming out of these trihalomethanes, um, things such as um, chloroform, um, different, different things are absolutely terrible that come out of this uh, chlorine interacting with your water. 
Um, there's different ways to purify water other than using chlorine. Uh, fluoride is another thing that we should totally be free of. And I want to talk about fluorine or fluoride for a moment because fluoride has been a uh, very harmful and toxic side effect of the aluminum industry. And I want to read to you 12 points on fluoride. One, one of the world's most prodigious journals, Nature, volume 322, July 10th, 18, or 1986, answers the fluoridation questions more than satisfactorily. An examination of fluoridation trials and studies in the United States and throughout the world show that large temporal reductions in dental decay cannot be attributed to fluoridation. It is now time for a scientific re-examination of the alleged enormous benefits of fluoridation. I might add here there has never, never been one complete test indicating the value of fluoridation as related to tooth decay. This has been an educational farce that has been perpetrated upon the publics of uh, the citizens of many, many different countries throughout the world. Point two, Dr. R. N. Mukherjee and Dr. F. H. Sobels from the University of Leiden in Holland found that fluoride increased the frequency of genetic damage in sperm cells which were produced by laboratory animals exposed to x-rays. It is evident from their studies that fluoride inhibited the repair of DNA damaged by x-rays. Their conclusion, quote, sodium fluoride resulted in a consistent and highly significant increase of the mutation, in other words, the genetic damage frequency. This effect is thought to result from interference with a repair process. Point three, Dr. S.I. Voroshilin and co-workers from the Russian Research Institute of Industrial Health and Occupational Diseases concluded, quote, it would seem to us that fluoride could cause some kind of disturbance in the enzymes that are related to the mechanism of DNA repair and synthesis. Four, Dr. A. Yarez from the Department of Toxicology from Central University of Venezuela in Caracas reported that, quote, fluoride added to the drinking water of female rats produced birth defects in their offspring. Now those involved in birthing our children know of the huge increase in birth defects and deformities in large cities where fluoridation is used. Dr. Robert Carton quoted in the spring 1987 issue of the Center for Health Actions publication update, he states, quote, the fluoride standard was based on political pressures without any regard to the facts, unquote. We are well aware of the political pressures and controls related to the desires of vested interests such as the pharmaceutical firms and the aluminum industries. Six, in this day of numerous highly contagious and death-dealing immune deficiency disorders, the use of fluoridation in the water supply in any amount would be highly irresponsible and suicidal. Please note, Dr. Shelia Gibson from the University of Glasgow showed that fluoride at levels comparable to those found in the blood of people living in fluoridated areas decreased the migration rate of human white blood cells. This directly affects adversely the immune system. Dr. Gibson found that only a six hour exposure of white blood cells to as little as 0.1 part per million fluoride inhibits the white blood cell migration by 21%. One part per million inhibits the white blood cell migration by 85% and two parts per million has a conclusive 0% relative migration rate. This indicated that a continued use of fluoridation in the drinking water could result in the total destruction of the immune response. Now let me point out, this was for only six hours. If you take, took the test for 12 hours or 24 hours, the results are even more uh, startling, which anyone with any intelligence would do all that they could to have the fluoride, fluoride addition to the water supplies removed permanently. Number seven, Dr. J. Gabrovzik a research dentist at Case Western Research University School of Medicine stated in a published paper, quote, 
because the inhibitory effects of sodium fluoride in phagocytosis and leukotaxis, which is the migration of white blood cells, which are basic defense mechanisms, I have doubts about the absolute safety of water fluoridation on a long-term basis. Number eight, Dr. John Yamianis, the author of Fluoride, the Aging Factor, and worldwide authority on fluoridation and a statistical relationship to cancer, has shown conclusively that fluoride damages body repair and rejuvenation capabilities and does, in fact, bring about the visible symptoms of aging, such as wrinkled skin and arthritis. He stated, quote, since the first publication of his book in 1983, a number of important articles have been published by researchers from around the world, and their findings are included in the second edition. While I am gratified to know that my conclusions in 1983 have been confirmed and extended rather than disproved by the results of this new research, I feel a greater sorrow in having to watch the unnecessary suffering brought about by fluoride." Unquote. Nine. As a physician, international health educator, and seminar speaker, I have found that an individual who drinks fluoridated water reduces the ability of the body to rejuvenate and regain youthful health. I have found through the use of live blood cell analysis that those who drink fluoridated water regularly have a relatively inactive migration rate of white blood cells, thus rendering their immune system ineffective. Now that's my findings. Uh, my name is Dr. John Whitman Ray. And that is my findings as a physician. 10, it is only reasonable to the candid and reflective mind that one cannot enhance the immune response and destroy it at the same time. My life work involves enhancing the body's immune response and rejuvenating capacities of the body. In the interest of our children, our friends, and ourselves, we need to educate each other and expose those who would enforce the addition of a known toxic substance, sodium fluoride, to our hopefully pure water system. Every effort should be made to stop the systematic destruction of our immune response by demanding without compromise the assurance of a continual pure water supply free from the addition of toxic and cancer-causing chemicals. Now, before you judge this statement, get the facts. Read Fluoride, the Aging Factor by Dr. John Yamianis. That's spelled Y-I-A-M-O-U Y-I-A-N-N-I-S. And then you can rest secure that you're walking on solid ground regarding the fluoridation battle. 11. Order the book Fluoride the Aging Factor by Dr. John Yamianis, The Health Action Press, 6439 Taggart Road, Delaware, Ohio, 43015 and distribute this information to your friends. Number 12, another book on fluoridation which is absolutely essential for the, your health library is, is called Fluoridation, a modern precustian practice by Isabel Jensen, RN. It's published by Isabel Jensen, RN, and the Tri-State Press Antigo, A-N-T-I-G-O, Wisconsin, 54409, USA. These 12 points were taken from an article in the Maui News, Sunday, March 6, 1988, uh, submitted by John Whitman Ray. Now, the next thing I'd like to discuss with you very seriously is what we call the mercury toxicity which exists in our teeth. And I would like to be very candid with all of you on this. <clears throat> there are different countries in Europe now, Sweden, Austria, um, Germany is looking at it carefully, Denmark's looking at it carefully, where they are banning or in the process of banning your mercury uh, silver amalgam fillings. And I'd like to solidify this thinking for you by giving you some compilations that I have made over the years pertaining to mercury toxicity. Number one, I've had the pleasure of testing several hundred patients and students in my field of body electronics with a Jerome mercury vapor analyzer. Might add, this is what's found in all of your submarines and all of your spacecraft. 
I have found only two people in all of my testing who have not evidenced a continual toxic exposure to mercury vapor emanating from their silver amalgam dental fillings under normal chewing compression. The amount of mercury vapor emitted under normal chewing compression exceeded in 10 seconds what the maximum allowable mercury exposure would be in industry in a 40-hour work week, as is indicated by both Russian and USA standards. The amount of exposure to mercury vapor is totally unacceptable to the scientific mind. Two, dentists have been educated to believe that once mercury has been combined into the filling material, it remains locked in and can't come out. The sad fact is that there is absolutely no scientific research in existence to support this hypothesis. To the contrary, all evidence indicates that silver amalgam containing approximately 50% mercury is a source of extremely toxic elemental mercury adversely affecting the health of the human body. Three, evidence now demonstrates that the surface particles of the amalgam filling material are being chemically broken down and released into the oral cavity. These minute particles of mercury filling are acted upon by oral and intestinal bacteria to produce methylmercury, an even more toxic form of mercury. Some say 100 times more toxic. It's a, it's a very toxic, uh, the methylmercury is a very, very toxic form of mercury than elemental mercury with target areas being primarily the pituitary gland, the thyroid gland, and the brain. Four. It has been demonstrated that dissimilar metals in the mouth can also contribute to electrical activity and corrosion, much like a battery, and can result in unexplained pain, ulcerations, inflammation, and disruption of corresponding meridians in the body. This may result in a wide range of unexplained symptoms and disease. Five, the presence of mercury in dental amalgams has been shown conclusively to adversely affect the body's immune response. It has been shown that after amalgam removal, the red and white blood cells levels tend to seek normal range with a corresponding increase in the body's immune response as evidenced by T lymphocyte count increase. Six, research has indicated that mercury is a single most toxic metal that has been investigated even more toxic than lead, cadmium, or arsenic. Point seven. The International Conference on Biocompatibility of Materials was held in November 1988 in Colorado Springs, Colorado, USA. <clears throat> Many of the world authorities on mercury and mercury toxicity met to discuss the issue of dental amalgam and other materials used in dentistry. Their official conclusion was drafted and signed which read, based on, quote, Based on the known toxic potential of mercury and its documented release from dental amalgams, usage of mercury-containing amalgam increases the health risk of the patients, the dentists, and the dental personnel. Eight, autopsy studies from Sweden and Germany show a positive statistical correlation between the number of occlusal, occlusal surfaces of dental amalgam and mercury levels in the brain and kidney cortex. It would be wise to point out that both elemental mercury and organic methylmercury were found in brain tissue upon autopsy. Dr. David Eggleston of the University of California found a T lymphocyte count of 40%, pardon me, 47%. The ideal levels are between 70 to 79 to 80% in patients with silver amalgam fillings. After removal of the amalgams, the T lymphocyte count rose to 73%. 10. Multiple sclerosis patients have been found to have eight times higher levels of mercury in the cerebral spinal fluid compared to neurologically healthy controls. Inorganic mercury is capable of producing symptoms which are indistinguishable from those of multiple sclerosis. 11. It is the responsibility of every dentist and doctor to inform and educate their patients to the effect that, one, mercury is contained in most dental filling material and all 